All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. So this round, we're on to the high energy physics subgroup talks. And we are starting out with William McCormick speaking for the Harris Group. Hello. Uh, yep. Well, I'm William or Patrick, whatever you prefer, <laughs> speaking for the uh, Harris Group. I'm going to be focusing on the HEP stuff that we do in the group. Uh, if I were to draw a Venn diagram of all the things that we do, there's like some overlap with some of the LIGO stuff. Um, but yeah, today, for me, the HEP stuff. Maybe. Why is it? it was going earlier. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so since I'm the first person that gets a crack at this HEP stuff, um, I can talk first a little bit about the uh, workflow in the CMS experiment, which is somewhat similar with what happens in Atlas, uh, which is that you have a bunch of uh, collisions in the detector, um, and it's way too much to read out and analyze every event. Um, so you have a multi-level trigger. There's one trigger, um, which is hardware-based. It's very much optimized for speed, uh, using FPGAs and ASICs to achieve a latency less than four microseconds or so. Um, and what to note is that once you deploy your algorithms, they're not really tunable, especially if they're ASICs. Um, then there's a second layer, which is this high-level trigger, uh, still part of the overall trigger system. This one, though, is based on CPUs, uh, where there's much... Uh, well, more time per event allowed, 200 milliseconds, which isn't that much. Um, and what you're running here is some streamlined versions of your offline algorithms. Um, so you are reconstructing somewhat high-level objects like electrons, muons, primitive jets, which are streams of particles. Um, and then finally, you write uh, events that pass this high-level trigger out, you store them, and then you can analyze them later offline. Um, here, there aren't as many latency constraints, um, and this is right now a purely CPU-based system. Uh, and of course, you can reprocess your events whenever you want and update algorithms to improve like, resolutions or tagging algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we're doing in the group is trying to get our fingers into basically every part of that workflow to try to improve it. and how can one go about improving a system that has already been shown to work? Well, for example, uh, in the trigger, um, you know, one of the uh, embarrassments isn't the right word, but a feature of the LHC is that we haven't actually found any BSM physics yet. Um, so <laughs> like a worst case scenario, of course, is like, we're creating a lot of BSM physics, but we're just not finding it because we're not triggering on it. Um, that's, you know, the worst case scenario. So what we are trying to do uh, is try to improve or increase the complexity of the algorithms that we can run in order to have a more sensitive trigger. Um, and Phil has this sort of quote unquote crazy idea of running some extremely high or low latency, very sophisticated trigger where you're doing everything at 40 megahertz rather than this multi-stage system. Um, you'd have to ask him for his detail uh, for details about his exact vision there, but he's really into this. Um, and then second in the offline stage, um, what we're going to run into in the future when we switch to the HLLHC, which is going to like make our data like multiplied by a factor of 10 as far as you know bits per second. Um, is that the processing is going to consume very substantial CPU resources, uh, and that's only going to get worse. So the idea is to improve our data processing efficiency to save ourselves some, from some catastrophe where we just can't keep up with processing our data. Um, we're here at the A3D3 workshop, um, so I'm sure everyone is very um, familiar with the fact that you can speed up uh, the inference of machine learning-based algorithms uh, by running on things like GPUs or FPGAs. Uh, I quote a little 10 times here just to give you a sense for that, but depending on the architecture, it could be 50 times if you throw it on an FPGA. Um, so of course, if you do that, you can increase the complexity of your trigger algorithms that you're running in this hardware-based stage. Um, and you can use um, packages like HLS4ML, so high-level synthesis for machine learning, 
uh, to make algorithms that are compatible with your FPGAs. So this would be on the L1 trigger side of things. And then on the offline side, um, machine learning based algorithms are becoming increasingly common in the data flow and the workflows um, as our domain algorithms designed for GPUs. So of course you want to use GPUs to decrease your per event processing lat latency and free up CPUs and avoid this whole situation. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about some of the trigger level uh, updates that we're working on in the group. There's a poster later, which I encourage you to check out, which is partially covered up. Um, this is not so much stuff that I'm working on, so I will probably fail to do it complete justice, but you can hang with me for this. Um, so the group is heavily involved in deploying different ML architectures on FPGAs um, and has been, that has been the case since before A3D3 existed. So there's this paper from 2018 about deploying DNNs on FPGAs. Um, members of the group were involved in that work. And in, since then, uh, there's been a lot of recent involvement, talking the previous two or so years, uh, on focusing on deploying more complex model types on FPGAs, like recurrent neural nets, quantized neural nets, using semantic segmentation on FPGAs, symbolic regression on FPGAs, uh, things like skip connections for resource, resource efficient inference, uh, transformers, uh, contrastive learning for VAEs, graph neural networks, knowledge distillation. Um, actually uh, gonna be a presentation at ESAN later on this knowledge distillation stuff. Um, and this isn't really even covering the full list. There's a lot of ongoing efforts in the group um, as far as actually deploying model types on FPGAs. And then as far as the applications to physics, which is what you might care about as a physicist, um, there's also a lot of effort in the group into turning these complicated algorithm types into uh, useful things for CMS, for example. So for example, uh, you can imagine embedding autoencoders on FPGAs for some fast anomaly detection, which is to say like at the trigger, try to find events that look the least like regular standard model type events. Um, you can do some uh, neural net on an FPGA for vertex reconstruction. This has been shown to improve um, vertexing resolution, for example. And you can use various techniques for compression of calorimeter, so HCAL or HGCAL. Um, and even outside of CMS, you can imagine doing GNNs for tracking and triggering on FPGAs. And I think there's this um, semantic segmentation has also been applied to things like self-driving cars. Um, that's kind of out of the purview of HEP, Phoenix marginal. Um, and some of the specific work, uh, just to highlight, one of the projects is deploying um, particle flow, PF, particle flow. It's basically an algorithm for reconstructing individual particles in CMS and puppy, which is related to pileup suppression, um, which is additional irrelevant activity in the detector. Um, so deploying these algorithms in layer one on an FPGA using HLS tools, high level synthesis tools. Um, and so you can see some mockups of where on the hardware these algorithms are and uh, people in the group have managed to fit these algorithms on the hardware that is actually used. So you can take like very raw detector inputs, run these somewhat sophisticated algorithms and then secondarily have another layer uh, within this um, L1 trigger where you run um, algorithms that use like individual particles to reconstruct objects like uh, muons, electrons, jets with better resolution than what's currently used. And all of this fits in the latency constraints for the trigger. Um, so for example, this flow step takes less than a microsecond per event. Um, and one such uh, algorithm to highlight is B tagging uh, using a neural net um, on current FPGA hardware. So B tagging is identifying when a jet comes from um, a B quark. Normally this is done by combining calorimeter information and tracker information. And that is true here as well. This is just something that is relatively sophisticated. Um, and it, doing this at level one is very impressive and earned Aiden um, this award in the MIT physics department for an undergraduate thesis. 
um, basically he was able to get a um, improvement in the acceptance for these rare physics events. So creation of two Higgs bosons decaying into four B quarks, which should result in four B, ta B tagged jets. Um, so increase the acceptance of this by up to 25% in some regions of phase space, which is very impressive. Um, and this is a particular process that is being very actively studied for some BSM implications that it could have. And another algorithm, for example, would be a tau neural network. So um, an FPGA deployable neural network to identify tau leptons. So it's just like a heavy muon or electron. Um, and the algorithm itself is relatively simple. So it's a three layer MLP being deployed on the FPGAs, um, but you get a very large decrease in the trigger rate um, for little efficiency loss in actual taus being identified. So you want to decrease the amount of triggers that you see from unnecessary stuff uh, while retaining all the real stuff, which are the taus, and that's what's accomplished here. So this is a, another really nice little algorithm that comes from the group. Um, so now talking about some of the offline stuff and reducing CPU loads using coprocessors. Co um, obviously, I was mentioning that you can run a lot of ML algorithms on GPUs and achieve an immediate speed up. Um, so you might want to run out to Best Buy and buy a bunch of machines with GPUs in them, which is a valid approach. Uh, the only problem is that you might be misutilizing your GPU resources. So if you were trying to run too few models on your GPU, you wouldn't be using what you paid for. If you tried to run too many models, you wouldn't have paid for enough. Um, and there's this relatively narrow sweet spot where you're just like constantly using all of your GPU, uh, which is somewhat hard to achieve obviously. Uh, but in order to sort of improve the GPU resource utilization, what you can do is turn to this inference as a service paradigm, um, where you start inference servers on your GPUs, then other CPUs, so either in the machine that's running the server or machines um, outside that are connecting via a network can access the server as well. And so you can tune the CPU to GPU ratio in the scheme. Um, this has been something that's been worked on in CMS. We're also in the group currently working with some Atlas members to build on this effort um, and to spread the benefits around the whole HEP community as much as possible. Um, it, within CMS, uh, this is, uh, approach is called Sonic Services for Optimized Network Inference on Coprocessors. There's a somewhat complicated plot here of how exactly this works, where you just send physics information into your server and then receive the outputs by a few relatively simple commands that have been implemented in our software. Uh, how to do this is with NVIDIA Triant Inference Servers. So this is an industry uh, developed um, software set. Um, and all that this experimental software has to do, software has to do is um, basically gather the physics information together. So for example, if you were doing some jet tagging you just assemble particles and information about the particles. You ship that over to the server. The server makes some inference in one of basically any backend that you want to use. Um, and then you retrieve that information. And I was talking about having all these nice backends available. This is an improvement over what's currently in CMSSW because in CMSSW, your, your um, model has to be either an Onyx or TensorFlow. So by using the uh, Triton, you can basically give yourself extra flexibility when developing your models. Um, to uh, sort of demonstrate how all of this works, uh, we looked at one step in the offline workflow for CMS, which is this mini AOD production, which is kind of a data slimming step where certain jet tagging algorithms um, and other such things are run. Uh, normally this is done uh, about monthly for CMS, we'll reprocess all of the data. Um, and we ported a few algorithms, which occupy about 10% of the total per event latency through Sonic to see if we could basically remove that 10% from the mini AD workflow. Uh, and just before I get into the results, I'd like to point out that we were running this in a variety of um, locations. So we were doing this in the cloud, doing this at Purdue, um, doing this at Fermilab, and you can communicate, since this is an inference as a service scheme, you can communicate from CPUs at like 
Purdue, talk to a server in the cloud. You could do vice versa if you wanted, depending on your firewall situation. Um, this is a really flexible setup. Um, and it was good to have all this diverse uh, compute available to us. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of backend work that you can do. Uh, you can explore server setup parameters or things like um, controlling the number of requests coming into with the server at once, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then once another simple test you can do is scan the optimal CPU to GPU ratio for various models. I mentioned that that was a important component of this whole scheme, this inference as a service scheme is that you can optimize your GPU to CPU ratio. And for example, these scans shown in this plot were performed in the cloud. So for example, if you consider the deep met algorithm, which is one of the algorithms, it takes about 500 uh, four threaded jobs running into a single GPU to um, saturate that GPU. So, you know, if you were going to try to do this on a machine sitting alone in a basement or something, you'd have needed to buy like a really wacky machine with 2000 CPU threads and one GPU. Um, so this is the kind of scale that I'm talking about. Um, you can also test, for example, whether the uh, distance from the CPUs to the GPUs affects your per event latency. Uh, we were able to run, for example, um, having your GPUs in Iowa, which is where Google Cloud is physically, um, and then the machines at Fermilab, or sorry, Purdue um, in Indiana, so at least going through Illinois. Um, and there was seemed to be no difference in the latencies here, so that's another check mark. Um, you can check whether adding all of this like overhead contributes um, overhead that um, reduces your per event latency. So this would not be a good thing if adding in the scheme um, made your d uh, diminished your throughput, um, but it doesn't. So this is another check mark. Um, you can run this scheme as fast or at least as fast as the default scheme, all on CPU. And then when you turn on GPUs, uh, you get exactly what you expect, which is about a 10% increase in the average throughput because you're taking, again, those models out of the workflow, putting them in a GPU where the latency is 1% of what it normally is. Um, and you get this nice speed up in the overall MiniOD processing, which is exactly what we expected and wanted to demonstrate at a scale here where we had um, tens of thousands of CPU cores and um, I think about 100 GPUs running at the same time. So this was sort of a, a maybe one-tenth scale demonstration of what actually goes on in the MiniOD production for CMS. Um, in addition to actually just demonstrating that we can run the scheme, we've developed or been contributing to the development of a variety of algorithms that can be run through this scheme. So for example, one of the grad students has been developing this dynamic reduction network for energy regression and CMS's electromagnetic calorimeters. This is done in PyTorch Geometric, which is again, not a backend that's natively supported in CMSSW. So this is something that wouldn't be otherwise possible. And what we found is that this does improve your resolution for things like um, dielectron events or diphoton events um, in the barrel and in the end caps. It's all in all a win-win. Um, and right now it runs via Sonic in CMSSW. And another algorithm that we've been working on is one focused on HCAL clustering. So this is uh, in collaboration with other colleagues at MIT and Washington. Um, so this is a sparse point voxel CNN for HCAL clustering, um, which also uses a Triton supported Python custom backend and torch sparse. So again, not something that you'd be able to throw into CMSSW without a whole bunch of extra work. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate so far that we can cluster with comparable accuracy to the generic clustering that's already in CMSSW. And uh, by running this algorithm, we can take advantage of GPU-based accelerations. Um, and we're hoping that we can improve on these physics results further because we're natively using some depth information in, that's in the CMS, or CMS calorimeter, which is not used by the default algorithm. Um, and we're also working on improving um, some of the timing results as well. So improving the acceleration that we already see. Um, so to sort of wrap up, uh, we're involved 
in developing ML algorithms and implementing hardware-based acceleration at all stages of the CMS workflow. Um, many members in the group are contributing to the deployment of complex ML-based models on FPGAs, for example, um, to improve trigger sensitivity to beyond the standard model physics or rare standard model processes like that um, DIHIGS to 4B process that I mentioned um, in Aiden's thesis. Um, we're working to develop um, a scheme to run ML algorithms efficiently on GPUs um, and to really fully utilize whatever GPU resources that we have um, via this inference as a service scheme. Um, and when we use Triton servers, for example, in this inference as a service scheme, we can take advantage of industry efforts um, and deploy models with diverse backends, um, which gives us some flexibility and allows us to write models that would not otherwise be able to be used. And I would just also like to point out, maybe, I think I'm getting kicked out or something. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there are a lot of other related projects in the group to A3D3, though not maybe specifically in the high throughput um, umbrella. So for example, we're working on um, anomaly detection techniques uh, for offline analysis um, using the semi-supervised approach. Um, this is basically, well, I think the thing that came before Guac, which Eric was talking about, um, this was this, like, Quack, the original stuff um, for HEP. Um, members of the group are, of course, working on these uh, um, LIGO um, projects, which have already been talked about, so I don't want to uh, go over them again. Um, some members of the group are working on exploring metrics and latent spaces of physics manifolds. Uh, this is really sort of more of a theoretical machine learning type project. Um, so really not in the high throughput environment, but interesting nonetheless. Um, many people are working on contrastive learning. Um, so again, more of machine learning theory-ish and also working with some student, um, Sam at Cornell on using um, quantile mapping with normalizing flows for data Monte Carlo agreement. Again, machine learning, but maybe not to be deployed extremely quickly. Uh, yeah, so we've got our fingers in a lot of pies in the Harris group, um, and I'm hoping that uh, yeah we can speed up all of CMS. That's the, Phil's grand vision is to run CMS instantaneously as much as possible. <laughs> all right, any questions? That's that's my end. Yeah. Back up. Maybe time for one quick question. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Could you give a detail on the contrastive learning projects? Not really. I I don't work on those. <laughs> um, Eric, right there. Pass. Can you pass the mic to the guys standing right to your right? He works on those. Eric, say something about contrastive learning. <laughs> um, contrastive learning has a lot of interesting applications in high energy physics for classification, um, for different types of like a data Monte Carlo kind of ag agreement um, and for exploring kind of systematic uncertainties. Um, oh yeah, I, I thought the, the biggest uh, advantage, well, my understanding is to build a foundation model to train on large unlabeled data and then do some kind of field short learning to build a foundation model. Uh, have you guys uh, attempted in this direction? Or maybe another example is like, what specific algorithm have you guys been using to do contrastive learning? Right, so I think we, I think we have explored this, this avenue that you're discussing. So, so where you basically kind of train some embedded contrastive space and then do a single shot learning on this uh, contrastive space. Um, we've done this for kind of classification type tasks. Um, um, if you're asking for specific contrastive algorithms, um, I think what I think you might be referring to is like different types of losses that we're exploring, like possibly like VicReg or, or SimClear kind of contrastive losses. Um, um, there are some interesting studies that we're doing on, you know, like improving systematic uncertainties with SimClear, for example. 
um, that's coming out pretty soon, uh, relatively soon on archive, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've definitely explored this kind of classification, few shot learning space. Um, and yeah, 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 sure. Sorry, I don't, I don't work on all of these projects and uh, Bill actually is explicitly told me to include this bullet, even though I don't know anything about contrastive learning, so. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, and next up on the schedule is the Lou group. Uh, hi, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, just give us one second. You're, you're ah, sure. You can share your slides if you like. Uh, yeah, sure. Give me one second. We're still working on the audio. Could you say something again? Yeah, sure. How about this? That's much better. Thank you. OK, great. And you should see the slides now. Perfect. OK, let me see. Oh, I get this full screen. Ah, here we go. It should be somewhere here. OK, great. So then I get started. So yeah, this is the update from uh, Mia's group. You can see our small but growing team uh, here. So we have uh, Mia in charge. Uh, now two postdocs with Yao joining, and we have me and a bunch of uh, students, and then Dimitri as a, a software engineer working on Sonic. And so um, basically our activities in the context of uh, A3D3 are our kinds of machine learning algorithms uh, in combination with heterogeneous computing, aiming basically at all three kind of reconstruction tiers of uh, uh, that we have in CMS, so the level one trigger, the high level trigger, and then the often reconstruction. And I guess at this stage, I really should thank Patrick for already uh, introducing all these concepts. It's going to save me a lot of time. Um, and so the concrete project we're working on is um, an end to end GNN uh, reconstruction for the level one trigger for Ray Tollop in the case, um, an improved object reconstruction for the offline uh, part using uh, semi-supervised GNNs for pilot mitigation. Uh, and in general, we're working very close cooperation with the uh, Panelist group uh, in general, and of course, science uh, developments, such as uh, the interpretability of the GNNs um, and some other things. And we're also involved in the development maintenance of the necessary software tools that enable these uh, developments and the deployment, uh, which are mostly HLS for ML. So the deployment uh, of GNN on FPJs, there is our focus. And then uh, Sonic, which Patrick, of course, also already introduced in detail, where we are focused on the deployment and uh, integration in, in the CMS distributed computing uh, infrastructure. So uh, as I mentioned, the first thing we're working on is um, uh, trying to trigger a red tau to see on the case with GNNs. So in general, um, in, in principle, the tau can decay to see in the standard model. But as you can see here, we basically have a neutrino oscillation required for it, so switching a tau neutrino to a mu neutrino. And that very severely um, suppresses the branching fraction here and goes down to something about of uh, 10 to the minus 55, which of course is not something we'll probably still be able to measure in the near future. But if you look at um, models uh, beyond the standard model, you can have significant enhanced branching fractions here. So this is kind of a generic uh, supersymmetry model with uh, R-part evaluation where you have uh, a SUSY partner to the neutrino, neutrino here um, that then can decay into uh, the two additional muons giving us three uh, in, in total. 
And with that, we can get branching ratios as high as the order of 10 to the uh, minus eight. And that is much more uh, reachable by uh, confirmation experiments. And um, we're specifically interested in kind of the upcoming high luminosity IHC because it will produce something like 10 to the 15 uh, tau's. Uh, so we should be able to do a lot with that, uh, provided we are able to actually trigger these events and record them. And the issue here is that we are really talking about muons with an extremely low transfer momentum, which are very in the forward direction um, of the detector. And if you look at the kind of traditional approach where we really basically um, have to reconstruct the muons themselves and determine their uh, kinematics for each of the three muons from like, the hit pattern in the detector, um, it's really unlikely that this will actually really uh, work out because uh, you usually have at least one of these neurons that have such low momentum that uh, you just miss it with, with these techniques. And so um, the solution that we're investigating is to basically do an end-to-end -end reconstruction of just the whole tau symmetry topology uh, uh, in total using uh, graph neural networks. And so, um, the graph construction that we do for this is outlined here. So in principle, um, the CMS uh, muon detectors are arrayed in what we call four muon stations that the muons traverse one by one from the inside out. Um, and then the information from the muon detectors in each of the stations are kind of aggregated into short track segments. And these track segments are what we use as the nodes for our graph. And what we found is that basically, uh, as long as we include information on the first three stations, that's kind of sufficient and the fourth station doesn't really add much more, uh, which is at least partially due to the fact that these very low momentum neurons don't all even make it out uh, uh, that far. Um, and so basically, as I said, these track segments are our um, uh, nodes. And so we basically look at the position and information of this these uh, nodes in space and then there uh, basically how much internal bending of these track segments we see in the magnetic field which includes information about the momentum and then we uh, connect these these edges by uh, looking at uh, the differences between these um, variables as the uh, edge features these things are also connected to a virtual node and uh, what we're doing right now is that basically while when we connect um, nodes within the single muon station, we make sure that they're not too far separated in space. Uh, while between stations, we look at our causal uh, uh, fermentations. And the model architecture is, is outlined here, um, basically uh, consisting of uh, an encoder MLPs for the node and edge uh, features. Uh, followed by uh, some number of uh, hidden layers where we use uh, GemConf uh, uh, to do the actual uh, graph convolution uh, and softmax aggregation. Uh, yeah, running the output to a leaky value. Uh, and in the end, basically coming to um, one classifier uh, that basically tells us if uh, we have detected the tau summary signature um, in the events or not, so we can uh, use that information to trigger. And the current performance of um, this model uh, looks like this. So basically uh, what we see here, this is the uh, distribution of this uh, score uh, in blue for um, our signal events. Um, and uh, then the yellow curve is um, pure kind of random background from uh, just random uh, lower energy uh, proton proton interaction. And you can see that kind of there's one population of signal events where we are actually quite confident in identifying those as sigma, whereas there seems to be like a second population which is not really much uh, distinguishable uh, from, from the background. And these are kind of the extremely low momentum neurons where uh, we just don't get enough hits to really um, make a statement. And that's, of course, uh, kind of unfortunate so because there's not much we can do for those events, at least with the current approach. But it allows us to basically perform a pre-selection on the basis of the number of nodes 
um, uh, basically just uh, just out of hand uh, rejecting um, all uh, events which have uh, something like the order of 25 um, and nodes. Uh, and basically then just allocate all our trigger bandwidths on uh, the events where we are much more confident in the trigger uh, uh, decision. And so basically what we can see in this curve here is, is the number of um, uh, accepted signal events as a function of what we allow the trigger rate to be. Um, and uh, basically, uh, in general, our uh, uh, area under the curve uh, with this pre-selection becomes something like 95%. Uh, so this is uh, uh, pretty good for events in, in this restricted phase space. And uh, basically, if we compare with numbers from previous um, estimations for the high Lumi uh, LHC run um, using more uh, traditional techniques, we uh, can, if uh, we were able to basically run this as it is, uh, get signal acceptances maybe up to a factor 10 higher than what we've seen before and would actually potentially rival by two um, in terms of the projected sensitivity. So um, this is uh, pretty promising at the moment. And if you're interested in more details on this, uh, I highly recommend checking out uh, our student Ben's poster in the poster session tonight. Um, based on this, we we want to take this further by setting uh, the application to different signals, setting stuff like anomaly detection, and uh, also basically going from the um, kind of uh, model floating in, in free space right now to an actual implementation for uh, the CMS of one trigger on FPGAs uh, on a demonstrator that we have here at Purdue, but that we have not used very much so far. We're looking forward to that. Part of that story is that we need an FPGA implementation for uh, for this model um, so that it can run in the trigger and meet the tight latency constraints. And what we already know is that the current model architecture that we're looking at that is just purely optimized for best performance is simply too large. And so we will have to reduce complexity. And for this, we started to investigate pruning, pruning and quantization of the models. Uh, basically, what we found is that we can prune something like 70% of the internal nodes. Uh, these results are for kind of an earlier iteration uh, of the model. So we have to recheck this with the current one, which uh, has, has better performance. But you can see basically that um, uh, basically, our signal uh, efficiency uh, stays roughly constant, even if we prune uh, up to yeah seventy percent of of the no nodes, and then it starts to decrease quite significantly if we go to even extreme uh, pruning. And um, so this is something we can do. And then we um, also did first tests with quantization awake training and uh, in Veritas. This also shows promising results. So for this early iteration of the model, we were able to keep something like 92% of the area under the curve when going from 32-bit floats to 8-bit AP fixed position. So um, uh, that's quite encouraging. Um, to really uh, move these studies forward, what we are uh, missing a little bit is uh, support for uh, these types of models in the HOS for my package, um, which currently does not support PyTorch geometric models at all, and the PyTorch support itself is also quite limited. So PMNs uh, are really not supported uh, in, in general at the moment. There are some model specific private implementations, for example, in EFS groups that we have been using as a basis for our first tests, but uh, a kind of much nicer way going forward would be to really. Uh, enable a GNN support in the tool in a more generalized way. And that is something that we uh, have been uh, tackling, um, basically trying to address the situation from the uh, ground up. So before looking to the PyTorch metric support we need for the graph neural networks, we started by re-examining PyTorch support in general. And so um, we basically re-implemented that uh, mostly uh, from, from scratch using the Touch FX package for its functionality to symbolically trace you know, the model. So basically 
create a graph representation of your model where in this graph each act uh, represents one layer or operation within the model and then you can do uh, kind of loop of all these nodes uh, and convert them into um, address from my layer configurations which are then in turn used to turn the whole thing into the internal address from my model representation and um, with this new implementation we were able to significantly improve the ease of use and also the generally supported type uh, number of, of different operations for PyTorch models in SLML, and these developments already have been merged into the port repository, so this will be part of the next major HMSML release, which uh, I think was expected for Q2, but since then this just ended, uh, so it's going to be like Q2-ish um, for this to come out. And uh, basically, currently we're in the process of extending uh, this and building on top of that in the support for GNNs uh, in PyTorch Biometric. Um, here, we really need to mention that we're working extremely closely with Vladimir uh, on on this, who is also pushing this forward uh, with quite a, a lot of effort. Uh, but basically, yeah, we, we want to enable the passing passing of the pathogenic models, uh, add support for message passing operations, which is not trivial to to do at the moment because. Um, there are some issues with the symbolic tracing when it comes to the nested structure of these operations. And we're adding support to a couple of new operations like, like the scatter edge operation to Azure SML uh, that we need to implement um, these sets of models. But things are looking very promising and we're actually expecting the first full prototype for that will be available at the, the end of summer um, if everything goes according to plan. So switching gears, um, a different topic that we're working on is pileup uh, mitigation where uh, there's a super semi-supervised semi network. So just to briefly reiterate the concept of pileup is basically that at the AHC, um, uh, at the very extremely high beam intensities we already have, we have multiple interactions between protons each time with bunches of protons um, cross. And so you get a bunch of uh, extra signals on top of each interaction that you're actually interested in. Uh, and, and this is what we call pileup. And all these additional particles from these additional interactions, they basically contaminate all, all your measurement. Uh, this especially affects all kinds of uh, observables um, containing hadrons, like, like jets, hadronic jets, or the calculation of, of the missing transference momentum. Um, this can be quite easily mitigated for just particles where we basically can just reconstruct the particle track and then we know where it's coming from and can only take into account those particles that come from the interaction we're interested in. So the real problems are the neutrals and the current best approach in CMS was this is an algorithm called Puppy, which basically weights the impact of the neutral particles on these high level observables depending on uh, the neighboring charge particles and if we are interested in those those or not and basically to uh, improve on on that um, we've been involved in um, a, a graph based semi supervised uh, approach allowing us to train directly on, on real data or full simulation without worrying about the labels and basically the end goal of that in the future would be a, a fully data driven uh, pileup mitigation technique. Uh, we're not quite at that stage yet, but what we are um, currently doing so far is basically there's a uh, graph um, uh, created for, for each event consisting of the charged particles that come from the uh, leading vertex, so the one that we're actually interested in, then you have all the charged pileup particles, so for these we actually have labels, uh, and then we have all the neutral particles for, for which we don't really have labels. And so what we are trying to do is basically predict the labels for neutrals based on what we know about the uh, charged particles. And um, basically this uh, semi-supervised way enables potentially the possibility of training on data um, in, in the future. Uh, there are some results uh, on this already public based on CMS fast simulation, but the, this network is now tested and trained uh, on the CMS uh, full um, simulation. 
And so just to flash here a little bit uh, of the uh, performance uh, that we have for this. So um, there uh, was a Bayesian optimization framework implemented for uh, this to optimize uh, the physics performance of, um, of these GNNs uh, using basically the um, to, uh, basically using the uh, sigma and the mean of the uh, dead mass uh, distribution as a figure of merit, so basically minimizing both the bias in the mean and the, the resolution. And uh, based on that, we, we find that we already see now for jet masses and um, and partic uh, and jet momentum that we get a better or at least similar resolution uh, and uh, uh, good results for uh, how the mean. So uh, the puppy GNN slightly outperforms the baseline puppy algorithm. Um, yeah, this is basically just a summary of uh, also these previous slides. But one thing we need to advertise again is that we have a student with a poster attending um, the workshop. So please uh, check out Jack's poster tonight for uh, much more information. And then the next steps for this project is to integrate this into CMSW and fully commission it using the data that CMS is collecting in the ongoing one three of the LHC. Then the last topic is um, uh, heterogeneous computing as a service. Um, I think I can be very quick about the introduction, given that the, the concepts of uh, Sonic and NVIDIA Stratum servers have already been uh, discussed by Patrick previously, but uh, yeah, basically, it's uh, the idea is to uh, make GPUs available uh, as a service to the CMS software workflows. Uh, as mentioned before, there's one workflow that has been developed and tested using what's called a mini AAD workflow, which is one step in the CMS data processing that offloads some of the uh, machine learning interferences to Sonic. Um, and the performance measurements, uh, as also mentioned before, have been done on Purdue computing resources and CMS has a paper about that creation. One thing that we are st just starting out to look at is that basically currently you have to create an interface to Sonic for each uh, machine learning model or algorithm kind of separately. Um, and so we want to investigate if there will be some steps that can, can be taken uh, in kind of having some at least semi-automated sonification of, uh, of workflows. Um, and then lastly, kind of you know, some uh, infrastructure work that uh, we are do, uh, performing. So basically the CMS software is run in a distributed way in many computing centers worldwide. And so each of these have to then provide the Titan service to enable Sonic in the CMS workflows. And um, Basically, to do that in a in a, a neat and consistent way, several things have to have to be developed. It's kind of a, a load balancer to basically allocate um, uh, resources um, to individual jobs, the dynamic creation and destruction of, of the strategy service, and um, some way to advertise the available service and jobs. And also some way to deal with different versions of the CMS software that might be used at the same time in different versions of the machine learning uh, models. And so we are in the process of developing uh, a setup where this is uh, done inside a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes cluster, where we run the Triton service as a containerized uh, application, uh, allowing us to use industry solutions for the development challenges. For example, we can then uh, uh, make use of uh, load balancing setups that um, uh, uh, create service and allocate resources based on perf uh, performance and uh, usage monitoring. Uh, basically, something that that can be uh, based on uh, Nvidia's implementation for that. And studies are ongoing to implement things like access to remote GPUs outside of this Kubernetes cluster. Load balancing costs different types of GPUs and also model repository solutions to make machine learning models available uh, without the need to uh, mount specific file systems. Um, and 
uh, yeah, there are many ideas that are being um, developed in, uh, in that direction. So to conclude, uh, our group aims to use machine learning to improve physics and computational performance at all stages of the data platform and CMS, where we have some focus on GNNs, mentioned the android reconstruction of Tau Sigmu, uh, the semi-supervised semi learning for the pilot mitigation, and then infrastructure work like the GNN support for uh, HSML, and um, other work on uh, sonic tracking. And yeah, our group is still rather small, but continuous expanding, and we excited to work on many more new ideas going forward. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Um, the the puppy GNN model is there. I mean, is there a reason that it has to be a graph to get the sort of like nice semi supervised benefit that you get, or could you in principle do this with any architecture? And it's just a graph makes a lot of sense for this task. Um, unfortunately, just as before with Patrick, you have kind of found the one topic that I'm really not working on myself. So I actually do not know. We have Jack in the room, uh, but I'm also not sure if. He knows, but maybe he can comment on that. Um, to answer your question, um, just particularly how the data exists in the A to five space we're using, a graph structure makes the most sense. And seeing as how uh, pile up particles tend to be clustered together. Uh, more and so using neighborhood information, uh, which is, I mean, a feature of graphs, obviously, uh, just works the best for this specific task. Um, there are some convolutional layers, I believe, in the network, but mainly formatting it as a graph task just works the best for it. All right, I think in the interest of time, we should uh, move on to our next speaker. So let's thank the speaker again. Next up, we have another Zoom presentation on behalf of the Duarte Group. Okay, hello everyone. First of all, can you see my screen and can you hear me well? Yeah, loud and clear. Awesome. All right, let's get started. So my name is Russell Morgan and I'm a first year, actually going into my second year PhD student working with Javier Duarte. And yeah, so let me tell you about the work that we're doing at UCSD in the context of the A3D3. So, um, okay. So yeah, I have an outline just to keep track of things, right? So first let's start with the overview. So these are all of the members that we have currently. Um, as you can see, our A3D3 group at UCSD is pretty large. It involves faculty, postdocs, grad students, master's students, postbacs, undergrads, and even high school students, but they are not here. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um but yeah, and then just an overview of the projects, right? So our group is broadly interested in two areas. The first one involves enhancing uh, core algorithms in particle physics with machine learning techniques, since they have better scaling properties and can be accelerated in GPUs. So these two, these are the two projects highlighted here. Here on the left is an event display of a simulated proton-proton collision event reconstructed using machine learned particle flow reconstruction, which attempts to deduce particles based on detector signatures. Then here on the right is a transformer-based generative model to simulate particle jets, which can mimic computational intensive physics simulations. 
Then two additional projects are equivariant machine learning methods, like this Lorenz equivariant out encoder for anomaly detection on the left, and the self-supervised learning here on the right. And all of these have like links to, to the papers where you can learn more, more about them individually. The second area here involves deploying, um, sorry, deploying machine learning on FPGAs for real-time applications for the, um, sorry, one second, what is this? Okay, sorry, yeah. So the second area invo here involves deploying one application in real-time data. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry about this. I don't know, I'm having some difficulties here. Yeah, so second area is here, which involves machine learning and FPGAs for real-time applications, including in the CMS level one trigger. So here highlighted is um, compression for the future CMS subdetector called the high granularity calorimeter would be this one here. Then finally, we have two additional applications which involve um, long-lived particle jet tagging for the CMS phase two level one trigger. And then we have anomaly detection in CMS run three level one trigger. And this, this two will be, will be the main focus of this talk. All right, so let's jump to it. So first I'm gonna give you the motivation and, and some of the current limitations that we're facing. And so everything starts with a question, right? So we must be aware of the mysteries that the standard model cannot explain. For instance, the Big Bang should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Obviously that was not the case. So we wonder why is there more matter than antimatter in our universe? Then this next plot shows the, uh, the components that make up our universe, right? We can see that there is only approximately 5% of the composition of our universe that we more or less understand. However, what about these big chunks, these big chunks of uh, dark matter and dark energy? Those, we, and we just don't know anything about them. So that tells us that there has to be more to the standard model than, the, than, than we currently know. So enter anomalies. Anomalies refer to anything not well, modeled by, not well modeled by our simulation of the standard model. These anomalies are often discarded during event selection. Such anomalous signals could be detector flaws, new physics, or also beyond the standard model signals. So what if we have been discarding interest in physics when selecting events? That's the main questions. That's the main question regarding this these anomalies. Then we also have long-lived particles. Here we refer to beyond the standard model signals. They're predicted to have relatively longer lifetimes than the standard model particles. Thus they have decay vertices farther than the collision point. Several theories predict their existence. And just to name a few, we have supersymmetry, twin Higgs, and uh, dark, uh, dark sector models. Here this plot shows a uh, model where the Higgs decays into Two of these longer particles, which then decay into uh, two quarks each. Yeah, that was just a cool depiction. However, we have no evidence of LLPs yet. Limitations have been pointed out, which limit our ability to discover BSM signals. In part, our inability to find beyond the standard model signals may occur at event selection levels called triggers. Triggers are in charge of saving events during live collisions and after for further analysis, further and offline analysis, right? Here, here's, here's a cool cartoon, which basically depicts kind of the workflow of the um, triggers inside of the CMS. So for instance here, when the LEC is running, the level one trigger receives an input of 40 million particle collisions per second. The level one then selects collision events, which produces an output of 100 kilohertz. And so at this point, 99.75% of events are rejected. And then at, at the high level trigger, this, this output is brought down to one kilohertz, which we then use for our analysis and searches, right? And um, 
Yeah, so I mentioned live collisions and offline. So I just wanted to make the distinction of what happens where. So here, this part on the left, right, when the L1 trigger is receiving uh, data pretty much. So that, that's happening live or in real time, as opposed to here, the, um, the high level trigger and our offline analysis, which it all happens like when the LHC is not running or just offline. And triggers might be biased towards promptly decaying particles, in a sense of standard model signals. These potentially discards events where beyond the standard model signals are found. Starting 2026, the CMS detector will undergo the uh, major upgrades in preparation for the HL or the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider. And at UCSD, we aim to implement beyond the standard model signal-oriented triggers based on machine learning on the level one. That's this level right here. And algorithms at this level, uh, they run on these devices called FPGAs. And just in case you're wondering, I made a slide here, what are FPGAs? And FPGAs stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. And these are devices which allow the acquisition of data at the sub microsecond and high data rates previously mentioned. As, as we learn, um, currently the L1 trigger handles data from 40, 40 million collisions per second and events are selected at a latency of 3.4 microseconds. And here is just a picture of how FPGA is compared to the more common CPUs and GPUs and also ASIC devices. So, and here we can see that towards the left, the devices tend to be more flexible allowing reconfiguration. However, they handle smaller and simpler functions and have lower uh, processing capacity. And as you go towards the right, um, you lose flexibility, meaning that if you wanna reconfigure the devices, you, need, you actually need new device. You actually need to replace the device, right? But they can handle more complex functions and have very high processing capacity. And so an FPGA lies somewhere here in the middle and they provide us um, flexibility, meaning that they allow reconfiguration, they can handle complex com functions and, and, high, and they have high processing capacity. Okay, so now let me tell you about the long lead particle jet tiger at the level one that we're developing. So the LLP jet tiger is an, a machine learning algorithm trained to trigger on LLP signatures. Our goal is to develop this algorithm to be efficient enough to infer LLP signatures, fast enough to meet latency requirements, and compact enough to fit in the limited resources of the trigger hardware, or in a sense, FPGAs. Okay, so the model architecture is based on two 1D convolutional layers, which act as featureizers for input from each jet. And so here is a picture of, of the model. Particles are clustered into jets using the serial cone algorithm. And each jet contains 10 particles with 14 features. So essentially here, you can see that the input would be 10 particles with 14 features. And that will they will go into the first layer, the first 1D convolutional, uh, layer, then then the sec then we have the second layer, which is also a 1D convolutional layer. And the, the, um, the features include the one hot encoding of the particle type, transfer momentum, um, pseudo rapidity, and then phi is scale relative to jet. And then we have the um, vertex information, essentially. The 1D convolutional layers are followed by downsize downsizing and um, and dense layers, as you can see here, this it would be from here to down here, all the way here, to produce a value between zero and one, which is the likelihood of being an LLP jet of, it's, it's, uh, it's a score, right? Pretty much, it tells us whether uh, a jet is, is an LLP jet or not. And this actor, I uh, just wanted to point out that this architecture was inspired by a BJ tagger, which was, which can be found here on this review. And the preliminary results, right? We use the receiver operating characteristic curve to describe the performance of our tagger. The ROC curve tells us the efficiency of our model at a given background rejection rate. So we focus here on this on this plot and we look at the, here the red lines, right? So here, this is telling us that at approximately 0 0.6 uh, signal efficiency, we have a background efficiency of 0 0.01. 
meaning that we're rejecting approximately 0.99 or 99% background at this point. And the area under the curve, which is also called the out value is a number from zero to one and suggests the overall performance of the model. I'm referring to this number here. And, and the number is 0 0.945. So, so it's pretty good, right? It's, it's, it's not bad, the performance. However, we aim to improve this given that the background at the level one will be very large. We want the signal efficiency to be higher, specifically on the region inside of this square because we will be rejecting more background at this point. So we want this, the signal efficiency, efficiency to go up somewhere here because we will be rejecting more background. Okay, and machine learning models must be converted to the firmware needed to run on FPGAs. The, the common Keras or PyTorch models are converted to what we call high level synthesis or just HLS. To do this, we employ the HLS for ML tool. This is a tool specifically for implementing trained machine learning models on FPGAs. A typical workflow is shown in the figure. So for instance, here we have like, you have your algorithm in Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and you have your model. Then you tweak around your model. Um, then comes the HLS conversion, and you can tune that, and after that, it is ready for co-processing kernel and also the uh, custom firmware design, right? The HLS formula also provides resource utilization estimates, allowing us to tweak our, our machine learning algorithm for the resource and latency requirements are not met. And this brings me to the next slide. So this is what a typical um, report looks like. So here on the left, we have the utilization estimates and on the right, it tells us the latency, but uh, for the sake of time, let's just focus here on where the error, uh, the arrows are pointing us. So here we can see that this, this column, the DSPs, which are, are the digital, digital signal processing, which basically allow us to perform arithm arithmetic applica um, applications on the uh, FPGA. And we can see that the utilization here is 213%, which, which is high, right? And so for that, we turn to what we call quantization. Often calculations by ML algorithms are performed using 32-bit floating points. This is not needed to achieve op optimal performance. Quantization can help us reduce the precision of these um, calculations. So we, we reduce the precision of the weights, biases, and others in the neural network without significant loss of performance. And this helps us reduce the resource consumption of um, our machine learning model of, on the FPGA. So this is the performance of, of our model after being quantized. And it doesn't change much. And you can see that here, the out value, the out value only differs by 0 0.01 from the previous um, result that I showed you. So that proves that um, the performance or, or we can quantize our model without losing significant performance. Okay, we're making progress here. <laughs> so what's the current status of the LPG attacker? So the workflow of the L1 trigger on the FPGA board is as follows, right? We, it will have a section called the deregionizer, which I will not go into it too um, into detail, but um, then comes the, this, this section will provide data to the uh, jet ID. This is where the silicone algorithm will go. This is what basically reconstructs or clusters particles into jets. And then it will go on to the next sec section, which is the jet sorting, which is basically sorts the jets in terms of uh, their transfer momentum. And then we have the, um, the neural network algorithm. And I'm currently working to add our machine learning algorithm to a test APX FPGA board, which is similar to the FPGA that is gonna be running um, on the CMS. So that means, that means this, uh, this section right here. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, anomaly detection. 
All right. Anomaly detection at the level one. The goal is to develop a machine learning based anomaly detection algorithm for the level one trigger. The basic idea is we train on zero bias data, or in a sense, just pile up. And events that are similar to the bulk of data get low anomaly score, which, uh, and that means that they are not stored. And events that are not similar to uh, to bulk to the bulk of the data get a, no a high anomaly score and are saved as interesting events. And the strategy for this, right, is we use unsupervised algorithms to detect non-standard model like anomalies using um, variational autoencoders. And what are variational autoencoders, right? So autoencoders compress input to a smaller dimensional latent space than the compressed and calculated difference. Now, variational autoencoders model the latent space as a probability distribution. And it is possible to detect anomalies purely with latent space variables, right? So uh, for instance, for instance, here on the figure, we have a physics, we have physics objects, in this case, jets as our inputs. Uh, the encoder encodes the information by compressing the input uh, to a smaller latent space. Then this uh, latent space is modeled as a probability distribution, just as shown here below. And the latent variables, like the mean and the variance follow a standard normal distribution. Then the decoder is in charge of reconstructing information back to its original um, form, pretty much. And so just to show you some of the results, right? Um, so the, here, here I'm showing the reconstruction across different physics objects. We have met, we have muons, selections, and photons, and we have jets. And just to summarize, we see good reconstruction across physics objects in, in momentum in the x direction, as you can see here. We have some only like some um, marginal losses here or marginal differences. Um, then this is the RSC curve of the uh, of the uh, model. It reads similar to, sorry, it reads similar to what I explained in previous slides, except that here we have uh, the trigger rate output. The um, the markers, as you can see, his or these small dots here. These are the markers. They represent the current L1 trigger efficiencies for different signals. So if we focus here at the red dotted line, right, we have the signal efficiency of the machine learning model, for instance, here shown by the solid line for the different signals here, um, compared to the current level one efficiencies for respective signals as well. So here the, um, the marker shape represents the uh, different L1 um, algorithms that are currently, and then the color, the color represents the different signals that we're uh, considering. And so if we look at this plot, we see that, that at this threshold, the efficiencies are roughly equivalent. Okay, so we come to the end pretty much. So to conclude, we learned that uh, we may be limited to detect beyond the standard model signals because of triggering biases at event selection levels inside detectors called triggers. The CMS detector will undergo major upgrades starting in 2026 in preparation for the um, high level LHC, or sorry, High Luminosity uh, Large Hadron Collider, which opens up the opportunity to implement machine learning on the triggers. And our goals at UCSD in the context of the level one trigger are to develop BSM signal-oriented machine learning algorithms that are efficient enough to infer LLP signatures, fast enough to meet latency requirements, and compact enough to fit in the limited resources of the uh, trigger hardware. And something that I'm that I, that we're starting to look into is basically this concept called pruning. So pruning essentially penalizes the model for having too many non-zero weights. Here is a depiction of uh, what that is essentially, and it is a dynamic process during the training phase where the model itself learns to uh, set some some of the weights to zero, leading up to less multiplications, and in a sense, that's going to use less resources. Um, on the FPGA when the model is is um, is deployed in the FPGA. So here we can see it's kind of hard to see, but uh, basically some of these connections have been turned off 
This is called unstructured, unst uh, unstructured pruning. Um, and then we have a structured pruning where, where actual nodes are turned off. And studies, studies have shown that pruning actually leads to improved performance uh, with respect to just like, say for instance, a uh, compressed model, like a smaller model, or uh, if, our, if, if our original model was like too large to begin with. So yeah, that is, uh, that is all that I have. If you have any questions, I'll take them. Questions? If no one has it out there, then I'll ask a simple one. Uh, pruning, unsupervised, supervised versus like dropout. Uh, how are they similar or different? Yeah, so as I was explaining, pruning is is a more dynamic process. So like in for in dropout, you actually are setting some nodes or, or it, the model sets nodes to zero pretty much based on, on, on whichever um, rate you specify, right? So, but pruning is it actually it's, it happens during the training phase where the uh, the model learns learns to turn off some of the uh, connections, some of the connections that basically don't play or don't play a significant role in the performance of the model. That's the uh, that's the main difference. Nice, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? All right, then let's thank our speaker again. All right, thank you so much for the attention. Okay, next up we have Elham Koda on behalf of Shiche's group. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll give the update for Shiche's group here um, about, you know, accelerating data driven discovery. You can hear me, right? About accelerating data driven discovery in high energy physics. So, um, just a quick introduction of myself. I'm a postdoc at the University of Washington, Seattle. Um, I'm part of Atlas Experiment and also, you know, the NSF A3 D3 uh, group. And I'm working on new physics um, searches in Atlas, particularly TT bar resonance, and uh, also doing anomaly detection search with machine learning uh, with generative algorithms. So we're working with UW students here, um, Ali and um, Alex, and also working on uh, neural network based pixel cluster splitting for Atlas. And in terms of A3D3 and fast machine learning, um, I'm doing some work on. Um, I already finished this work, like LSTM grew and uh, uh, transformers, implementing them basically on um, on the PGA based tool called HLS for ML. And uh, here we are collaborating a lot with the Scotts group at UW, and um, we have uh, also other work going on in the GNN tracking as a service with um, collaborators in LBNL. And uh, we are also organizing Patrick and I. We are organizing the. Uh, Plus machine learning core processor meetings and part of the equity career of AC industry. So that's just that's a quick summary of what I'm doing, but you know, like I'm not gonna talk um, all of these first of all, and also I'm gonna talk several other things which I'm not working. So our group activities are split into multiple different directions. So it's, it's a high energy physics group. So there will be lots of, you know, interest in the high energy physics side, anomaly detection, applying algorithms on, um, on hardware for uh, trigger application particularly, then there are some work um, 
kind of you know stretched in the heterogeneous system. So where we are working on um, this, uh, these are different algorithms, implementing them on APGs, and also um, particularly as I highlighted in the previously, uh, working on implementing some genetic algorithms for APG for a, a machine learning um, machine learning algorithms for APG tool HLS for ML. We are also collaborating with the new AI, AI integration at UW. So you'll hear uh, more about that from Shahan's talk later this afternoon. But I'll also highlight, uh, you know, a few things about those those work. And our group is also involved in um, direction of education, outreach, and engagement uh, at the very end as well. Um, so let's get started with the particle physics. Um, so the major work are in the direction of low latency inference um, of machine learning algorithms on APGA ASIC, um, including Atlas Trigger. And the other direction would be GPU-based acceleration of particle physics software. Um, so you have seen this diagram a few times, I think, today. But you know, just to remind you, we have like two level uh, of trigger system in particle physics experiments, like in CMS and Atlas. Um, particularly um, for Atlas, we will have uh, this. This will be called in in the upgrade uh, beyond 2026, level zero, and even filter. These are the two levels, and we're reducing the frequency data. The, the data coming at 40 megahertz to one megahertz to 10 kilohertz. So these are like two level of filtering the data since we can't store all of them. So the first level has to be, uh, the level zero has to be on hardware because of the latency requirement of microsecond. Uh, and the second one can be on uh, CPUs or GPUs uh, in the order of uh, microseconds. So um, now the question is how to run um, things on uh, like the machine learning algorithms or other algorithms on APGAs. You have already um, listened to lots of other um, talks today, uh, how they're doing it. Um, Essentially, we're using HLS for ML, and I'll show you um, some of the work that we did do in that direction. Um, so that kind of um, gets me to the other other part of, of our work activities in the targeted systems. Um, so that's like HLS for ML, a very quick overview. I don't want to uh, spend much time on it, but we're mostly taking care of TensorFlow, TensorFlow models, implementing instructions here, and then when I run it on a PGA, that's, the, that's kind of the goal. Um, one of the projects I want to quickly wanted to highlight, I was uh, collaborated with uh, MIT group and, and also a um, few other people in uh, UW uh, ECE group. Um, so this was on RNNs. Um, so we implemented um, gated recurrent uh, network, there's a GRU and LSTMs on APGA or support for that on APGA. Um, so essentially, you know, when we uh, when we think about implementing a machine learning algorithm on a PGA, we think about all these computation that can happen. Like, you know, you do some matrix multiplication, some addition, and then uh, do some function call with our activation functions. Um, so, uh, so you can think about all these multiplications and additions can happen in different units of the of the of the circuit a PGA. Um, so, particularly DSPs are very um, very efficient for those kind of things, and then uh, all this functional call. Like taking computing this and taking you know uh, evaluating the function that can happen in many different ways uh, like lookup tables flip flops and can also be run on rams so we basically took the same uh, you know type of implementation that we have for dense type networks and we um, just augmented them and did a little bit of uh, implementation around that to have the support for this rn based architecture that's a very quick um, overview um so it uses a lot of things that we had in the tool already. Um, some of the performance plots, it just shows that uh, we tried, uh, we tested three different type of algorithms, like number of the number of parameters versus complexity. So small model, simple problem, medium, large model, um, slightly complicated problem, and this is um, a little bit more complicated problem, five plus classifier with uh, more more than 130k parameters. And we can kind of show here that all of these three type of models are, um, we were successfully able to convert them um, on the PGA uh, with, with the limited resources and, and timing requirement. Um, the other direction that we are currently working on is the same um, idea, um, working on um, transformer-based architecture and implementing the, their support on the tool for the HLS for ML. Um, so transformers, I'm not gonna do you know, um, in detail, any detail mention of that. But essentially, I would say the transformers are um, very good for uh, processing sequen long sequential data. It's like the idea is similar to uh, how we do like a uh, RNN type model, also good for sequential data, but the transformers are uh, much better for long sequences and it's potentially more useful for gravitational wave applications. 
So in this study, we're actually collaborating with some of the gravitational wave folks uh, from A3D3. And um, uh, we, uh, we, can, we also, again, testing like three different type of models. Their, their complexities are not too different at the moment, but uh, you can kind of see like, you know, they're slightly different in different, um, different um, you know, uh, ways. And we can successfully um, we kind of implemented all of these. We can successfully convert them on an FPGA and um, you know uh, the latency at the moment we estimate for one of the models, which is this flavor tagging, uh, identifying given a jet, identifying which flavor it is. There's a three class classifier, um, around four microseconds. So it's which is like uh, you know um, kind of satisfied uh, is the requirement in particle physics exp experimental um, hardware trigger. Um, and then I'll be back again to the particle physics, more particle physics applications. So here. Um, one of the other things we're doing is, um, again, on the hardware trigger side, um, having the support uh, for testing hardware trigger uh, for Atlas uh, upgrade, which will happen beyond 2026. 2026. So here, um, the group um, with the, the collaboration with Scott um, and in the ETAP and then other people from Westmount and MSU uh, and Dylan from Penn, um, uh, there. Um, so basically the idea here is that we are implementing this um, algorithm processing unit which will host, which can host machine learning based algorithms. And um, it basically um, uh, abstracts, abstracts the whole uh, data flow. So you, you know, having that input data, running the algorithm, taking out the results and then passing it to the next step. So everything has been implemented through this uh, APU, they call algorithm processing unit. And a little bit more details of, um, of, the, of the structure is um, essentially, um, it has this APP, which is you know algorithm processing platform, which has all of these um, data flow um, uh, uh, things and all the RAMs and 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 synchronizations, fast synchronization enabled, uh, implemented. And inside this APP, this, there are these APUs, which are you can think of you can think about units which can run machine learning algorithms and other algorithms. So this setup has been built and um, tested. A few different type of algorithms has been tested already. They all satisfy the requirement of 1.2 microsecond latency, and then um, are um, using they are individually are using 10% um, of the board. So that's kind of the requirement that we have from Atlas side. So uh, now I'll quickly back to the online uh, offline part of the um, of the analysis. So so far we have been talking on you know this these two steps. Offline is the stage where Atlas and CMS in particle physics experiments we use a lot of machine learning um, machine learning tools. And there's the time constraint in, in such in that way. So you know you have lots of freedom. Um, so we have we are working on our group. We are working on um, uh, in some direction in 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 uh, uh, for offline computing. So one of the one of the problems first I wanted to highlight for offline computing in the future, uh, as we are um, having you know more and more uh, like in the future upgrade of the LAC, as we have uh, expect more and more data, there would be a um, kind of a crisis of CPU requirement. So the Required CPU is this this dotted lines, but this solid black line is what we can have. Um, this is a versus year. So the CPU consumption is way higher than what we can provide. That's kind of the problem at the moment, and lots of CPUs are being used for um, for simulation in particle physics. Now the question is, can we fast the Can we make this simulation faster? Um, there are a few ways one can make the simulation faster. Of course, like running them on GPUs, um, like normal algorithms, but just running them on GPUs. Um, and um, so you can say like 90% of the simulations task is actually happening on this, uh, in, in these two parts, it's like calorie meter simulation, a part of the detector. Um, so, um, so in this work, I'll, I'll just highlight from our group activity, um, the fast simulation is one, like I said, like having GPU based algorithms. So these are like custom, like traditional algorithms implemented on CUDA running them fast um, using the power of GPU parallelization. And the other way, uh, other, other uh, direction is, you know, having machine learning based generative algorithm, which will generate then uh, the do the simulation. So both the approaches are actually quite good. Um, they are kind of integrated to our software. Um, that's uh, called Athena and, and has been tested, tried, and, and the performance is pretty good. Um, just to highlight a few more other aspects of, of these algorithms. You know, the, the simulation of each particle is reduced from 0.07 to 0 0.05 milliseconds with GPU. But once we um, once we group particles, because we now could have a you know, power of grouping them together, uh, there could be a 10 times uh, speed up by using this kind of machine learning uh, based uh, ways or GPU based implementation. 
And, and there are a few ways of implementing them in the software chain in C++ and they're, um, they're all in place and physics and performance, like I said, they're comparable. Another quick thing I wanted to highlight um, is um, running thing, running algorithms as a service, this inference as a service, which Patrick already introduced in the morning. Um, but just to recap very quickly, the idea is that, you know, in a direct connection in a computing node, we can have a CPU and GPU, um, but um, in as a service mode, let's say we have uh, servers where we, ha we don't have GPUs or CPUs available all the time. Um, we, what we could do, we can, we can just offload our tasks via network to a server where we have GPUs. So that's kind of the basic, basic idea. Instead of relying on the resources locally, you just offload it to a resource where there are um, resources that we want, uh, a server where the resources are available. Um, so we're doing uh, the GNN based tracking pipeline uh, for, um, for, uh, for, for, for testing purpose here. So it's a multi-state process, uh, which is, uh, which involves uh, graph neural network and then few other uh, type of, uh, you know, algorithms, uh, basically starting from hits, particle hits to coming up with the track candidates. Uh, they're very efficient, good, um, and fast um, uh, on GPUs. Now, running these algorithms um, as a service, we are testing them in different platforms like this uh, supercomputer at Berkeley Lab and ARSC, and also uh, no, AWS uh, and, and Google Cloud. And so essentially we're just running this algorithm from a CPU node, uh, launching them uh, to GPU servers, which are running either one of those clouds or, or here. And, and that's kind of the setup. And what we see is that, um, if we run um, all of them, you know, in a directly on a, on a node where GPU is available, it roughly takes um, 20 millisecond uh, for um, per event. But if we run all of them um, using four GPUs in parallel, we can run first of all we can run 128 or more processes together at at, at, a, at a time. In a direct, we cannot run more than 10 because it goes out of memory, so it it crashes the job. So, but it takes a little bit longer for, 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 for event, it takes like around 25 milliseconds. So even though it's taking like in a slightly longer time processing each event, uh, it's processing more more events at, uh, at times. It, it processing like a lot more events. So in the in terms of throughput, you are actually gaining. Um, so that's one highlight. Um, another other quick um, um, activity is the group. I just wanted to quickly highlight. We are working on anomaly detection um, for, for particle physics, this is just a uh, bump hunting kind of search. Um, the assumptions are if uh, the anomalies are localized in one dimension of the phase space, uh, what we want to do, we want to just um, learn, um, uh, train the algorithms in the sidebands around the anomaly uh, where we expect and kind of, you know, learn the feature of, the, of those events and then extrapolate those, um, uh, extrapolate the uh, predictions into the signal region. So that's essentially what uh, is shown here. So we have the sidebands around the anomaly and we don't know a priori where the anomaly could happen. So the idea is that if we just slide, so start from one end and we can just keep sliding the signal region. Um, and we, tra we train on n number of variables and learn the features here of the event and in interpolate them into the signal region. Um, so right now we are using VAE and GAN based at workflow and the performances are very similar to other uh, competing methods and, and fully supervised, which is idealized here. And you see the maximum significance improvement is very similar to other alg algorithm and the maximum significance improvement means the how much this algorithm improves the significance compared to, you know, just simply doing signal over background count. Um, so yeah, so that's um, a um, few other um, activities from our grad students uh, and, and other collaborators. Uh, we are working on this SPP CNN based uh, calorimeter uh, clustering um, that is, you know, uh, promise, uh, sparse CNN based hadronic calorimeter clustering. It's very good performance. It shows very good performance on, uh, on the future detector. Uh, HGCAL is a CMS future detector. And um, also, current detector HCAL, it shows quite good performance. Um, and um, Accelerated on GPUs, uh, the work in the direction of accelerating on GPUs is ongoing um, at the moment. Uh, and you can sort of, uh, this, is, this is clustering problem basically, right? Um, so you can see here, like how this algorithm actually working. So these ground truths are these, these colors, these colors are diff coming clusters coming from different particles. So at the end of the day, you should, uh, your algorithm should identify them. The same color should be identified um, together. So this is ground truth. This is the, what SPBCNN does. You can see it's pretty good. Like in at this, it, this in this area, it's, it's clustering all the purple color um, hits, and 
other graph neural network based algorithms is actually kind of messing up things later doing is doing some spurious prediction of other type um so that's one visualization of the of the of this work um along the same line the same algorithm uh, is also being used for clustering for having particle vertex uh, for calculating particle vertex here again the same idea it's a particle track coming from the vertex so you're clustering tracks together uh, using this SPV CNN, and it um, it is just a schematic, and the work is in progress. Um, so um, the, I probably uh, um, so neural AI integration you have seen in the in the uh, in the morning. So the idea here is to predicting the neural dynamics from spike data, um, mostly the work kind of work we are doing at least. Um, so from our side, we are collaborating with the neural group here and Scott and 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 us. Uh, we are. Taking these kind of models, LFATs, you have uh, listened about, uh, you have learned about them in the morning, uh, taking them, uh, putting them on FPGS, implementing support for them on FPGS. At the moment, the LFATs like model, uh, not exactly the LFATs, but you know, the LFATs like model uh, has been implemented and it has a latency of five, 50 microseconds. And this kind of model, when they're uh, getting run on, on GPUs, the latencies are in, in the order of milliseconds. So it's a, it's a quite a bit, quite a bit of improvement. Um, sim, uh, some other future directions is like LFATS as a service and the same service as a service computing model. I think. And you'll see more details in Shaohan's talk um, slightly later in this afternoon. Um, another model that uh, Trang mentioned in the morning um, is based on transformer. Again, the idea is same. You are we are doing um, a neural dynamics prediction, but with the transformer based architecture. Um, this like the basic transformer based architecture current uh, has been estimated by the authors. Um, it takes about four microsecond microsecond on GPUs, and um, we certainly expect that it will take order of uh, like microsecond. Uh, sorry, it takes four milliseconds, and it certainly take order of microseconds when we run on FPGA. So our work on that direction has been ongoing at the moment, and. Um, just to quickly flash, the group is involved on in some education and outreach activities, like you know, like developing machine learning courses, high school internships, um, supervising lots of undergraduates, um, also like co-supervised by Scott's group in the Um, then running in, in different engagements, like you know, running, um, volunteering in this kind of events, APS Quip uh, event that happened in UW running lots of training events like HLS ML tutorial, uh, machine learning training program, and different uh, different places. Um, so yeah, so just to, uh, just to summarize quickly, um, so we're developing and accelerating machine learning based algorithm in Atlas um, in, you know, in mostly in two directions, offline tasks for particle physics and particle physics identification, and particle identification and tracking, that's developing algorithms and making algorithms faster for trigger application. Then, um, uh, in the HLS part ML direction, we are uh, actively uh, working with the developers and developing new algorithms and uh, improving the performance of existing ones. Um, we are also working with the neuro group here um, to accelerate the inference uh, to predict neurodynamics um, using LFATs and transformers. And we're also involved in um, several um, you know, outreach and training events. So that's pretty much it from my side. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Any questions? Well, I'm I'm curious about the outreach side of things. Uh, how how just generally has that gone, and anything you've uh, taken away from that? You know, the experience there. I think uh, I think the. Other people can actually come in more <laughs> because uh, some of the outreach, you know, I can tell uh, about the trainings a bit, but then this, I think the students would come in. So yeah, I mean, we we are organizing lots of you know generic machine learning uh, events, and then um, sometimes we have uh, HLS primal tutorials, and usually we see like you know people who never used HLS primal, they kind of get curious and interested uh, about that because it's kind of a catchy idea of running machine learning based algorithm on the hardware. Um, so that attracts lots of people. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if other people, like, you know, you guys have any comments on uh, having, you know, this, these events, hosting these events here or volunteering these events here? Yeah. Any comments about outreach? Outreach.
uh, RH is SVT3. And uh, we have uh, outreach pro the previous page. Yeah, we need to be closer to them right now, the computer. Right, so for the um, uh, high school internship, we have high school students and with a uh, uh, UW team. And for example, today we actually have one representative and Karum, do you want to say, should we have for everyone? Yeah. So um, it's a very interesting opportunity for, for us to walk. Uh, what's the right spot for me? Good. All right. Um, the, um, um, what we do is that we have uh, every high school students and team up with one of the uh, students, uh, usually graduate students. So it's uh, another mentor-mentee relationship. Just like many of you join the mentor mentee program and talk with uh, the other faculties in the other institute. And, but these mentor mentee have a very particular focus to share the machine learning uh, technique with the high school students and help them to work on one of our SVT3 data set. We will be very happy to share how we do this with uh, the other institute members. Thanks. Any other questions? So uh, should I just mention this A3D3 data set? Could someone give more information on that? I'm just curious. Uh, like what, they, what data set is it? Or like where is it stored? How is this published? Most of the data set in SVT3 are open data set. And currently we don't have a institute organized data set. And it's now sort of uh, CMS have uh, open data set and it is one. And most of our public paper also try to release our data and also code to be public. Um, so currently it's more like uh, institutional wise uh, uh, information. Yeah, this is something we can actually look into creating on like Zenodo. You can create like an A3D3 community and we can actually upload data sets to that community if we wanted to like make them all index together. Yeah. yeah. Let's thank our speaker again. Next up is Daywen Zhang on behalf of the Neubauer Group. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I'm here going to um, present, <clears throat> I'm going to represent the Neubauer Group uh, the overview for uh as of site visiting uh for SAT3 the workshop. So um let's begin. Um so first uh, let me introduce our group. So here uh where is ping? Oh so um this is our group. So uh Michael Neubauer is our is my advisor and we uh in our in our group we have uh, three postdoc and uh, markers and uh, he's working on the GM based uh, like EF tracking and uh, also the Avic uh, so she's he's also working uh He's he's working with expand expandable AI and uh, the and the fair and also have uh, like an anatomy aware machine learning for trigger and uh, for his physics side he's working for the vector like the, the quark search and uh, also um, we have another postdoc for the uh, Santosh so he's also working for the GM based EF tracking and uh, we have a uh, three graduate student and uh, one for, one of is me so um so i'm working for uh, analog ai or um i'm i'm this part is supposed by uh, like a 3 d 3 institute and also i also working for the uh, machine learning based uh, like a boost double double tiger and for the physics side i'm working for dihex and uh, ssh search for uh, for in the bbwwdk channel and um Another graduate student, Jared, and he's also he's working for the GM based EF checking, 
And uh, for his physics side, he's working for uh, Vector Boson the Scouting. And uh, also, he's also for, for also he's working for the Boson Pro Rising of where machine learning uh, the developing. And uh, the 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 Jian Chong Zhen, and he's also working for the VBS uh, Scouting and uh, for the semi laptop the TK channel. And uh, also, we have uh, two engineers, and uh, one is for an EC engineer, it's uh, Casey, uh, Casey Smith. And he's working for the GM based EF checking for the um, FPGA. And also, he is doing the v, uh, VHDL design. And uh, Ben is a work based of uh, NCS software engineering. His, mo his majority of effort is uh, doing like uh, the column data delivery. So basically, that is a kind of a service X in the uh, AF uh, U Chicago the service. And uh, me and uh, Santosh, me and uh, Jerry are uh, partial sponsored by the uh, SVD3 uh, uh, Institute. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, let me go to. Oh. Okay. So, um, let's talk about uh, the main uh, the computing the challenge in the HL uh, LGC. So, we know um, in HL LGC, like the F the effective like computing computational strategy as a uh, paramount for the device is uh, like in the re in the re resource like limited setting and particularly that is like very um, in high energy physics like experiment because uh, you see here um, so, so let so that is uh, the plan for LGC and for H uh, for Halumi LGC plan. So we are in currently we are here. So we currently in the middle of a round three. So. Um, in end of uh, 2025, we're going to have a long shutdown and we're going to um, uh, 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 upgrade to a high, lumi high lumi, uh, luminosity for the LGC. So you see um, after, so it's all be start from 2029. So uh, it's uh, during the HL in high, lumi high luminosity like HGC stage. So they nearly they're going to have like uh, 10 times of uh, more data set like per second than run two and run one. So that like, basically you see here. So um, if, uh, so the, the, the um so the, the the pink one will be the integrated luminosity so you will see here um so it's about like uh like 20 like 2000 second bombs like uh, for um integrated luminosity in round three uh in high luminosity um so compared with around two uh, round one and round two it's about like 10 times or more data set so that is kind of uh, uh more like a huge data like incoming in for in next 10 years so uh so we choose sort of the lead problem and we so we also have a tracking challenge in the high luminosity LHC for especially for Atlas. So um so this is a demonstration for the simulation for a PP collection event in Atlas during the high lumi uh, LHC. So you can see here that is a dense environment for like a 10 tens of K particle like pre, uh, pre collection. So you see here that is like about like 10 case um, 10 case of particles uh, like recording in the atlas uh, is a simulation. And the letter is about like uh, about 200 particles uh, interact uh, collection in one collection center. So um, so that is like uh, but uh, we see on the right hand side let's say that is like uh, construction like war time for the uh, reconstruction events um, with uh, uh, horizontal is uh, like uh, how many particles was a collection so um, the event the event reconstruction is kind of is a very like a computational like a challenge problem for the uh, high luminosity LHC because uh, we have uh, the particle tracking like will be taking about like forty percent of time to reconstruct the events. So in here, so you can see uh, the majority of the run two data set uh, is like uh, is recording in from twenty uh, twenty uh, from twenty collection and to fifty collection. So the war time is about like ten seconds to twenty seconds. But uh, if we will have uh, like uh, a high collection like a special ROM. So you can see uh, once uh, the collection go increase the, the more time for the reconstruction reconstruction events is uh, uh, is increasing exponentially. So that is why uh, we need to sort of uh, the checking challenge one for uh, high luminosity uh, the energy stage. Uh, the, it is a kind of a, a challenge for the data for checking for checking reconstruction. So um, we have uh, uh, one method to follow checking with uh, like a graph neural network. 
So basically, we just uh, briefly introduce uh, the graph neural network. It's a, just uh, it is just a classic uh, of uh, geometric deep learning like method for modeling like uh, data uh, dependency, like uh, using the, the message passing through the graph. So basically, we have an ITK data set, and uh, so we go, well, basically we just have using the metric learning or the module map, and we construct uh, the graph the construction. So basically, we have some graph right here. So you can just compute the node and the edge. So the node will be so um, the node will be associated with just like a represent by the particle, like a heater, uh, heater detector. So um, the lattice, and also we're using some edge classification. So you can see, so you can you can tell like uh, how much well, the edge it is. And uh, you can just, um, so you compare with uh, the choose tracker. So you, uh, you, are, you are find the edge, you will find the, uh, the edge like uh, with here. So you're with a high probability. So you will have an edge to reconstructing the, the graph. So, um, so um and uh, so that is a one effort. So basically, we have another um effort to with doing the event filter like EF. Like basically, we I I uh, I mentioned before, it's a EF uh, a graph neural network tracking the tracking effort. So the main goal is going to have a full of the optimized the graph neural network the pipeline to implement and uh, to testing the FPGA. So why we do the uh, FPGA because um. Compare, uh, compare with uh, GPU. So FPGA will have, have a low latency interference. And also we have a, like a very low, uh, like, a, like very reduced uh, power consumption. So uh, in this effort to, um, so this project has been done, majority done by the, uh, by the uh, Marcus and uh, uh, Jason, uh, 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 Jared. And uh, so he's basically, he's, he's putting the effort to uh, convert the Python code to, for the framework to the uh, implementation. So this is, has been like they just reduce re, re, reuse uh, HLS for ML and all of the thing to using the ITK data and also have uh, so this 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 effort has been explored on the track ML but they just redo it and they um and they writing rewrite uh, VHDL code from the scratch and from like for the module map and the truth uh, to the final track of the building. So that is uh, like uh, the GM for uh, ITK the pipeline, the the pipeline, the 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 map for here. So um, for the ongoing and the effort and uh, the future effort. So like going to concern uh, concern to only limited resource. So they're going to encourage encourage like uh, a new FPGA study, and uh, for the subgraph for the construction. So it's going to in the region uh, in the region of the detector for the module map. And also, um, they want to do uh, the quantization of where the training using the metric learning uh, with the MLP, and also the, the the pruning the study on the metrics learning sig um, significance uh, like reduce in the like a mod in the module module size at uh, maintains the efforts. So um, yeah, that is uh, what they they are going to uh, in the future work. And uh, also um, with uh, support from the like uh, like Illinois like uh, quant uh, quantum application program, so we have another approach like a hyper approach for graph neural graph neural network tracking. So we're going to like uh, we're building. So we're going to build our uh, graph neural network tracking like with a classic uh, graph neural network and with uh, previous like uh, they have a paper here. So like previous work has been done for the quantum graph neural network. We're going to developing. So we're going to re reproduce, reduce uh, to rep to re re uh, reproduce uh, like uh, the hybrid neural network. So this uh, this study is going to be like uh, to see the capability how quantum computing can can accelerate um, the graph neural network uh, like training. So that is uh, how we're going to do. So um, this is our team. So we have, uh, so we have, uh, so this study has been majority mo um, like lead by at least two undergrads. So um, I was going to briefly introduce uh, this, uh, this project. So, so they're doing, so, so this is uh, like a basically uh, the quantum, uh, the quantum graph neural network architecture. So um, I can, I can start off from here. So basically this is uh, like a first, like a forward, like full connecting layer. So this full connecting uh, layer is going to be um, like increasing the dimensional to uh, for the input uh, neural network. So it's going to feed in with, uh, so we're going to, so we, after the input neural network, so we're going to create uh, like edge network and a node. So this node will be recycling using for itself and also recycling to for uh, uh to recreate uh, to retraining for the edge uh, the edge network. And uh, after 
uh, like fix like uh, fix time like uh, iter uh, iter iteration. So they will have a finally they're going to they have a final um, node node uh, node network and edge network. So um, with a final uh, fully connecting like uh, neural network. So they're going to have a finalized so like they were going to summarize the the final the edge network and the node network. They will have output here. So that is one uh, approach for uh, quantum graph neural network. And uh, they have um, here have another size uh, hyper neural, ne neural network structure using the quantum uh, quantum polymerized uh, the circuit. So I will going to briefly brief brief introduce it here. So this is a similar thing. So that is like uh, they have a, like a full like full connecting layer here. So that is a classic uh, neural network. And after that, so they have a quantum stage here. And the that is like uh, they, and they go passing through the information encoding the circuit. Circuit and uh, after that, they will, they, so that is they, then they go into the parameterized the quantum circuit for the single layer. So that is of, go over here. So basically, that is do the transformation of a uh, quantum stage. And uh, this is uh, the final stage is a measurement. So basically, you measure the quantum stage, and after that, you uh, have a full connecting layer and to summarize all of uh, the final the final stage over here. So this is uh, like this premier. This study has been limited to um, the, the quantum circuit simulation, and it has been uh, using like sixteen uh, qubit to do the like, simulation. So um, and this is because of like, many uh, due to uh, thousands of qubit uh, section and required by the module. So and this study didn't require. I didn't know including any noise in, in this simulation. So that is. Uh, uh, the approach, like uh, we try to uh, to see how the quantum, uh, how the quantum computing can accelerate the graph neural network. And uh, so um, uh, then I need to just uh, for the analog um, AI, I going to uh, briefly introduce uh, what is uh, HIS for ML because uh, so HIS for ML is like kind of uh, like a framework like going to be uh, implemented like uh, for machine learning algorithm using uh, HIS in FPGA like uh, with a uh, low latency. So, um, so let us have a few advantage over here. So they can because uh, HIS like a majority like suppose like a most popular machine learning library and they can deploy like a model in real time and embedding like application. So that is why uh, we're using uh, HIS for analog AI. So that is uh, analog AI. So basically, um, we have uh, we we'll try to build uh, like analog AI using LHS for ML. So why uh, why analog AI? Because uh, analog can be computing operate in the continuously physical uh, quantity. So such as like a voltage and the current. So and the lattice have inherence like a parallelize and the efficiency of analog computing. So basically, that is a more highly uh, efficiency than the digital. So um, that is also for analog, it's like more energy efficiency and also have a low latency and to accelerate uh, AI algorithm. So right hand side, basically, that is uh, like a, a typically a sample of uh, like analog circle for uh, for AI. So basically, you can transfer everything together like to using the voltage and the and, uh, current as to represent, uh, to represent the circle. So, um, like we have been uh, working for a new tool for analog AI in HRS. So um, here is uh, the people we uh, get involved in the in this project. So um, so we have a collaboration with uh, UIC and FNL. Uh, and uh, also have uh, uh, like uh, the DPI the teams. So we are pretty much in the early stage. So we just um, like start with a simple MLP the primitive, the implement on a crossbar array. So I will show up later. So also uh, uh, we also have a synergy with uh, memory mem memory with a sim uh, CMOS uh, device. Also going to be uh, going to be uh, explored. Okay, um, so that is uh, how we're going to do for the mix uh, analog and the digital paths. So basically left hand side, with, in the start ways, we have uh, like uh, module training. So basically we're training with uh, Keras and with uh, TensorFlow. And uh, we, have, uh, they, we have a module design and uh, also we have a uh, uh, module pruning here. So also like we, we're doing this circle and after we're tuning uh, like a nice model. So we're going to dump into uh, using HRS for ML to have uh, HRS, HRS uh, like C code to um, for uh, for later for analog. So in the 
in after we have HLS for like a C code, we we're going to put we're going to have a analog a primitive like a in a for in analog circle. So we have a A to D. It means like analog to digital, and also D to uh, D2A is mean the like uh, digital to analog. So basically, we have uh, like a mix of vector operation, the matrix vector operation over here. So um, that is like why we uh, because why why we going to mix a digital because in we have some activation function and uh, that is uh, for analog the circle is like very difficult to um, to simulate. So that is why some in some array we using like digital in the final stage. So and the lattice uh and the lattice uh, some like uh, some. A company we have a crop like we're using the frap of uh, in frap, uh, fraction of uh, uh, primitive primitive for, for analog. So basically, this is few company we uh, like we the structure we're using for the quest bar. And uh, so let's uh, let, let's go to the detail. So um, this is uh, like a kind of uh, like a, like a, like a toy model for like machine learning agriculture, uh, agriculture. So basically, um, so basically we customize uh, uh, like uh, a in like a module. So basically we have a start with the beginning. We have a sixteen input with a four connecting layer, and uh, with four connecting. So this is a sixteen input uh, the input layer, and we can four connecting with a four. New, four newer in the first heating layer and the four connecting, uh, they have a node in the second heating layer and we have a one output here. So we have, uh, we quantize uh, the weight and the activation function of a neural network model. And we basically, we sort of try to set up, uh, so you see this is a structure like uh, in uh, for our model. So basically we, we try to set up with the output node to be the four bit because uh, that is we try to um, fix uh, like the output bit to be, to be four. So we design uh, like uh, the AT uh, SRAM, like a unit uh, unit cell. So basically, so so that is uh, like uh, the basic uh, the base of the design. So basically, we have uh, computer in memory the SRAM for the multiple. Uh, multi bits uh, precisely interference inference like we're using like a memory uh, immersed uh, data com uh, conversion and uh, multiple multiplication of uh, free operation and uh, so you see here so that is like uh, like a spectrum for the AT from the cell and also we have uh, computing in memory with uh, Monte Carlo dropout for the bias like uh, edge in intelligence so and uh, this cell will be going to be using in the in this uh, in in this uh, first layer analog uh, represent representation. So you see here. So each one will be the AT uh, SRAM cell. So for the so this is one layer. So this is the first dense layer we have, like for with a sixteen input and with the output with a four. So we basically we have uh, so in this cell in this uh, in this in first layer. So we have a sixteen bit uh, input. So let me we have a sixteen column here, and also we have a uh, so. Uh, and the, because we have a 16 weight, so basically we have uh, so we have a 16 row here. So also for uh, we have uh, the, the, we have the weight or the bias over here. So we have a 16 bias over here for but at least I only have one bit. So um, all this production line so it could be should be like uh, it's charging accumulators and the sum from horizontally is like from left and to right from left to right. So bit to by bit. So and. The, each bit should be like need to be a binary like the weight. So I mean it's like each bit should be a like binary weight over after after this here. So um, the goal for this uh, analog machine learning and uh, and for expectations. So we so this is a rock curve with uh, the uh, the pruning and the basic the baseline of a uh, machine learning um the machine learning rock curve for like a uh, HLS for the chat tagging. So that is a different jet, different jet. So that is Q jet and the T jet and WK. So uh, the dash line is the HRS the model training for um, for the jet. So we try to uh, using HRS for ML to generate uh, like an analog AI model to compare to and to implement an uh, analog model to ML based uh, jet tagger. So basically, we try to have a uh, like similar performance over compare with uh, uh, HRS and the baseline uh, carries like uh, the model. Try, we will try to have provide a similar performance as a digital HRS ML like a module. So in the future, so we're going to um, complete uh, we're going to complete uh, the full analog represent, uh, representation for entire like uh, AA module uh, AA model for structure. So we, we only have uh, the first layer now. So we're going to uh, complete the full the full neural network for uh, for analog 
and uh, going to uh, we're going to uh, going to tuning and optimize the analog AI model and uh, to have a uh, to have a performance like better uh, for high energy physics model and uh, going to we're going to have a beyond like a beyond uh, beyond the high energy physics model. Yep, um, that should be everything for me. Any questions? Yes. So, so for this just simple fully connected network, what is the what is the latency of this in analog? What you mean? What's a link from here? No, no. I mean, you make this comment that analog ML should be faster and should use less power. Yeah. So I'm curious, what like for this very simple network, how much faster and how much less power? Uh, you mean how much faster for like uh, analog compared with uh, HIS? Yeah. Um. Uh, we haven't testing like uh, how fast it is, but uh, I mean, it should be, I have no like very exactly solution for like, uh, like answer for how fast it is. But uh, yeah, um, we're going to test for that or. Okay. I, I... The short answer is we have, I mean, we haven't gotten that far yet, but if you think of, just think of it as, Signal propagation via clocking versus signal propagation via, you know, voltage current driving. I mean, it just so we haven't demonstrated this yet. It just seems inherently that that you know, if you can do these kind of analog computations, you in principle could do these in a much low. Like clocking is very power hungry, and it's slower than an analog signal propagation. But there are all kinds of other issues with, you know, parasitic resistance and capacity. I mean, there are analog issues here. But I think in terms of speed and power, it almost certainly would be better than any sort of digital implementation, but we haven't demonstrated it yet. 